comparable. We have joined together to keep Maryland ahead of the curve on some really environmentally dangerous practices known as fracking. Um, in every single state in this country where there is shale gas rock, you are seeing a dangerous form of drilling occurring. Um, it's a brand new kind of drilling where they not only drill down, but they drill horizontally and they pump that drill, that well full of water, sand, and a dangerous chemical cocktail that is allowing the gas, the rock to break up and the gas to escape. But what we're seeing in all the other states that drill first and ask questions later was a, a problem of flammable tap water, seismic activity in Ohio uh, where there was miniature earthquakes, uh, livestock kills where the livestock are uh, drinking some of the flowback water out of those wells and, and, and dying or having uh, uh, babies without fur and all kinds of deformities. Things that are causing a huge concern on our public health, on our environment, and for Maryland, it's, in my mind, a big question about the impact on the local economy. The shale that we sit on is out on the western side of the state, in Allegheny and Garrett counties, where the economy and the environment are tied together like a canoe and a paddle. People go to western Maryland because they want to hike the Allegheny Passageway or swim in Deep Creek Lake or kayak on the Yakagane River. And if we aren't sure about what all the impacts are of this kind of drilling in Maryland before it's done, we can't guarantee that we won't lose the state's number two tourism industry in, in the state and see an entire way of life in Western Maryland collapse. So I've been advancing, making sure that Maryland asks the tough questions, that we need to study this first. We need to learn the lessons of all the states around us that have drilled first and asked questions later. Because second chances are really expensive. And on fracking, we have to get this one right the first time. Our water is incredibly precious. And if we don't make sure that we are asking the tough questions and demanding to determine, can this be done safely? I will stay open-minded. I'm not saying we should never do it ever. But you're gonna have to prove to me that it can be done safely. This is America, innovate. Don't tell us that we have to accept these kinds of dangers in order to move forward on this kind of activity. And so we have put a, a de facto moratorium in place in Maryland that we are this year looking to pass a bill to confirm in the law that there will be no drilling until these comprehensive, uh, independent scientific studies are performed and we have an opportunity to review the risk assessment and make an informed decision so that we don't regret later having uh, done the wrong thing. Sure, we're several dozen feet from the water here, and obviously most of the eastern shore is very tightly tied to the water and, and very supportive of clean water efforts throughout the state and the EPA mandate for cleaning up the bay. Uh, with respect to some of the eastern shore counties in the TMDL coalition, Dorchester, Carolina, and Kent County that have recently signed on to support the Funk and Bolton uh, research project into essentially blaming Pennsylvania and kind of wing of dam for those of us who live downstream. I'm, I'm curious as to where you stand on on that scenario and what your perspective is on on uh, your, you mentioned Delegate Schmeagel earlier, friend, in this case he's an opponent and supports that coalition as does uh, Senator Pipkin, and where you stand on the environment and clean water specifically related to that TMDL coalition here on the shore? Um, the, I'm a huge supporter of the environment on keeping the bay clean, on addressing it both from an environmental and an agricultural perspective, having advanced cover crop initiatives and others to try to keep the TMDL down. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very much in support of, of addressing that doing oyster restoration work and all the recovery efforts that are a multi-pronged strategy that we have been undertaking and trying to steadily improve the health of the bay and understanding that while it's a crown jewel and a recreational um, spot for many of us, it's, it's a work zone for a lot of our um, watermen and you can't do your job if the, the bay isn't clean and producing what it needs to produce. Um, on the Conowingo Dam issue, um, I only recently have become aware of this. I saw some 
aerial photography the other day that was talking about some of the concerns, but could, uh, maybe afterwards I can talk with you. I, I'm not familiar with what you're suggesting uh, or at odds, what, what Schmeagel and Pipkin are doing that is at odds on this. Well, if, if I may, unless someone else has another question here before me, I don't want to take two turns. Uh, but all the local watershed organizations report cards suggest that local water quality uh, is poorest upstream. It shows quite clearly that our concerns and our pollution problems come from our land and how we use our land here locally. Uh, the Y River, the Eastern Bay, the Upper Chester, Upper Chop Tank are not threatened by Conowingo Dam overflows and these plumes that are shown in these satellite images that you're likely to have seen by now. And so Delegate Spiegel and Delegate Pipkin choose uh, to point the finger to our neighbors to the north and suggest that we shouldn't, as downstream users of this resource, do anything until our neighbors to the north, who periodically purge their sediment on us, correct their problem first. I don't see why it has to be one or the other. I mean, to me it seems that if you're, you know, I'm completely fine in trying to hold our neighbors accountable to not contributing to our problem, but that doesn't mean that we let um, downstream impacts off the hook and suggest that we're not doing anything here to contribute to the problem when we know that the scientific evidence suggests otherwise. We have to take responsibility to to do what we can to reduce our nitrogen loads here um, at, at every single um, waterway. And I, I'm very pleased that the river keepers and, and so many of the water alliances around the state, Clean Water Action and others that I've engaged with, are, are taking that strong stand. Before you close, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what Governor Heather would be like and what her administration would be like and what your vision for the to get elected from now on. Well, I probably, all joking aside from earlier, I, I should clarify that I am not an official announced candidate. Um, not, no one is, believe it or not. Um, we're all taking a very serious look at it. Um, and, um, but I won't deny that I would like to be your governor. And I know that I would be a good chief executive because I care deeply about this state and I wake up every day thinking about what I can do to keep advancing the policies that help make our lives better. And I work really hard at it all the time to make sure that, um, that we live up to all of our full potential here in this state. And whether it's my vision for uh, how we create jobs, how we continue to uh, improve health care. We, we have 800,000 people in the state that still don't have access to health insurance. We have 250,000 children that still go to bed hungry every night. We have 7,000 people with disabilities on a waiting list for services. We're the number one schools in the nation five years running, which I'm very proud of, but we still have an achievement gap that exists between our white children and children of color. There are, there are a lot of injustices that are still out there waiting for us to address them. Um, and someone that really cares every day about making sure that we tackle these problems with enthusiasm, with innovation, with creativity, but also with the insights and talents of everyday Marylanders. Our collaboration and our approach to these issues where these all aren't just my best ideas, they're your best ideas. We've got a lot of talent in this state. We've got a lot of personal experiences that can inform us about how we can build some new call centers in Dorchester to create new jobs and not have to have you drive to Beltsville every day, right? And when you're someone that's willing to spend every minute of your day out talking and learning and then taking those ideas and turning them into action and having a record of results that shows that you know how to deliver on this, that's what kind of governor I hear people want. I hear people want a governor that's not just running for office because she or he is next in line or looking for a professional promotion, but because they're ready to roll their sleeves, go to work, and get things done to keep making this the best state in the country. And you have my promise that that's what I would do if I free every day.